I'm Alison Dutrois from Gale Architects uh, in Copenhagen. Um, I'm not going to say anything about myself. It doesn't matter, really. Um, I'm American. I'm married to a British person who I met in Bristol. So I do have a little bit of knowledge about this place. I'm actually also, um, our office is engaged in some work here, so I know a little bit about Bristol uh, at a professional level as well. But what I'm trying, going to talk to you a little bit about tonight is how we, let's see, which one am I pointing at now? Am I doing this? There we go. I want to try and address how we look at cities, and there's some challenges or some questions that the Civic Society brought up uh, that made me think about you know, what Bristol's got on its plate right now as it looks at being the European green capital. What does it take to make a city work? Uh, is, it, is an often asked question, how do you make it, for whom are you making it work? How do you balance those drivers of change? I mean, Bristol's got a lot of national, uh, regional, local drivers going on right now, and that's a really big question of how, how to balance those elements. And of course, Bristol being the next green capital, Copenhagen is the green capital for 2014, Bristol's going to be the next capital uh, coming up, so how can you capitalize on those things? I think those are some of the questions on the plate today. What I want to look at, and in, by way of answering those, is that how uh, Gale Architects has, um, what, what, kind of, what kind of challenges we've found working with municipalities and private, um, off, private developers around the world as they try to make purple people first places. Now, Gale Architects is based on, um, uh, the work of Professor Jan Gale, and he has, he's one of the people who's kind of changed the thinking about uh, how we look at cities. Our focus at Gale Architects is really about creating cities for people, and people are the starting point of our work. Now, Jan always used to say that there's no city in the, every city in the world collects data on cars, and, and on buildings, and on capacity, and on efficiency, but no city in the world collects data on people. And that was true, and it's changing. Uh, there used to every every uh, city in the world had a department of roads and transportation and things like that, but nobody had a department of people. That's also changed, right? Rob Adams in Melbourne was the first uh, city architect who said, "Right, let's change that. Make a, uh, a, a department of people." And of course, we've here in the city have got a major shift in how um, the city is being structured with a, strate a strategic director of place, which really is no small challenge, actually. For us, the design of cities affect our behavior. Culture changes, and we know that it takes, more than, uh, it takes more than hardware, it takes more than design to get this behavior to change. Copenhagen model, everybody talks about Copenhagen right now as being this great city and cycle friendly and da 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 da. It is the lab in which we work. You all know these numbers, 50% of people um, um, who, who live or, or go to school in Copenhagen ride their bikes uh, to get to where they're going every day. 70% um, of those crazy people continue to bike in the winter. Trust me, it's actually easier. You do, and, and in this wet weather, it's horrible to get on a bus with a bunch of other stinky wet people, right? So, um, and, the, and the interesting thing is, is that if you ask people why they do it, um, because it's good for the planet, yeah, like 2 or 3% or whatever these numbers are, you know. Uh, because it's healthy, yeah, 5%. Because it's cheaper, yeah, a couple percent, so yeah. No, most of the people do it because it's the best option. It's convenient. It's easiest. You know, how many people quit smoking because the government tells you you're going to die? Who cares, right? Um, I only, I'm going to do it because it's nicer for me or it's better for me. And that's a really big shift. So we've got to find ways to, to think about that uh, in the larger world. Ha. Huh but we're not Danes, I often hear a British voice saying in my ear. Nor were those people. That's prior 1962, the main street in Copenhagen. Looks like a lot, I mean, you know, aside from fashion and, and um, of the cars and, 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 the, and the dresses, that's a lot of typical streets, right? Crowded pavements, lots of, lots of a, a, a road surface, very busy. And this is the same street today that carries 80,000 people for 24 hours in the summertime. It, that's at capacity, that's because it can't carry more. You know, it gets up to capacity. Now when this was done, back then, everybody said, come on, we're cra crazy, we're not, you know, they were saying, we're not Italians. <laughs> now, ch culture changes is the point. You go from places for cars to places for people. And what I remind you is that culture changes. It was that, it became that, and it was that prior 
So culture continually changes depending on what offer you're allowing people, right? So I'm offering, I'm kind of three, three questions, three topics that I'm going to try and address in my remaining however many minutes. What are the three things that we have found that really matters? You need to consider behavior. What gets measured is what gets done. And you need to exemplify change rather than lobby for it. So what do all those things mean? Um, we often, we know this model, you know, what is sustainability? Uh, Bristol's moving into being a green capital. We can talk about social, environmental, economic. Our ethos at Gal Architects, we often we want to say, is there more to it than this? What, is there something more that we're missing? We know how to build sustainable buildings. We know how to put green roofs and better materials and et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of path, uh, sustainable buildings don't necessarily make a sustainable city. We know that uh, you can see articles all the time in any real estate section um, that houses built near transport have better value. We know all these things. Maybe what we don't, everybody doesn't quite know is that you can achieve a uh, better savings of CO2 10 times better if you uh, build houses closer to transport than if you build to a German passive house standard. Um, that's kind of notable. It doesn't mean don't do the other things, but let's look at the big picture. Space and time are also resources, right? I mean, how long does it take us to get someplace? How, what kind of energy do we expend? So as we work around in, the, in, in cities, two key indicators are something that really help us work with city leaders, and in this case, I'm talking about, mostly about public uh, municipalities, that kind of client, um, make wiser decisions for the city, counting how many people are walking, and what they're doing when they're stopping. Now, if you have to walk from point A to point B, there might be a really busy street. The question is, what are your options to stop and to stay and to do other things? That's what starts to tell you about the quality of a space. This is how a lot of, well, even I, I'm old enough to say I was planned in this above uh, God, slightly masculine view of the beautiful thing placed beautifully on the on the page in symmetry or in asymmetry, but you know, and looking very much from above. And I think that's very, um, that's, that's very much in the roots of how we have structured cities, how we structure, uh, how we structure development movements, how we just structure our planning laws. And this is, I'm not talking in the UK, I'm talking everywhere. We are very good at finding places to drive through and the British traffic engineer is an amazingly well-developed um, profession that does it better than anyone else. And sometimes I have to say with all respect to Andrew Jenkins and your colleagues, some, some of them actually um, have created some real problems for us. And, and I'm, I know you can get us out of this too. And, and I wanna say that the slide on the right isn't a dig at Bristol because I know that this is changing. And it's sort of saying that you can get out of this stuff. We can, we can build our way out of it. Um, this is uh, one of the busy intersections in Copenhagen. And again, we can't do it, it's too busy of a road. How are you counting capacity? This takes 60,000 people a day, 60,000 cars a day. It takes up to 250,000 people crossing from Town Hall Square in the summertime. It takes 20,000 bicyclists. That's a level crossing, there's no grates, there's no gates, you get across that crossing in one green light. Even if you're eight years old, even if you're 80 years old, okay? So we, I'm sorry, these slides are, something funky is happening to my uh, layout. But have we been maximizing the wrong things is the question. I want to say, what about tolerance, generosity, these things that make up a quality of life, right? Because in this, in this 21st century, the street is a place. In a city, streets make up 20 to 25% of open space. Of that open space, 80% of it is street. We better start thinking about the street as a place. And I also want to say we've got to start thinking about everyday life. We can't, stop think, we can't think about events and jazz festivals and big special things happening in our streets. We need to think about where do I take my rubbish? Where do I walk to school? Can my kid cross the street? Can my grandmother cross the street? You know, where do, nobody picks up post anymore, but you know, where do I stop and take a phone call in the street? So what gets measured gets done. What do you count? And here I'm going to talk about New York City as an example. Uh, we worked in New York City, Mayor Bloomberg, wealthy mayor, it helps to have a billionaire mayor. Don't put that on, you know, don't tell Bloomberg. Um, but the point is, is that Bloomberg had a vision, but he also said, let's make it happen. And he had a countdown, because he only had a certain amount of time in office. And he got us on board to say, come out and find out what's going on in the streets. Well, we went out and we counted people. 
And we did a public space, public life survey, as we called it, which is looking at who's doing what, counting what they're doing, where they're going, looking at what the physical qualities of the space are. Now, the interesting thing about Times Square, who's been in Times Square? There's no square in Times Square. Shocking. We didn't really realize that. I've been to Times Square before, and I have to admit, I didn't really know that. We went there. We measured what was going on. In Times Square, uh, 80, uh, roughly 90% of the space is taken up by the road surface. 11% of it is taken up by the pavement and what little so-called open space there is. When we actually did these counts, we found that 90% of the users were on the pavements or the sidewalks, yeah? And the remaining 10 or 11% were on the road. Now, who are you designing for? If you're the mayor, 90% of your voters are on the pavement. If you're a retail shop owner, 90% of your business is on the pavement. Doesn't have to park a car at Manhattan prices. You know, what's going on there? Who are you designing for? That's the question. So increasing public space, we went through a process of looking, now anybody who knows Broadway cuts a diagonal across the grid. Let's steal back some space from vehicular transport. We actually closed some of the cross streets to uh, vehicles. Um, and you can find this on the web, I'm not going to go into it. Go to the Department of Transportation, look at their own information. Times Square before, um, Times Square after. There's no place to sit previously in New York. You were expected to go from place to place, but that doesn't offer great quality. Bloomberg said this is temporary, we're just going to do it, we're going to try it, put up some cheap chairs. He got the Department of Transportation to use paint that they had in their maintenance warehouses. Get out literally overnight, paint the street, get some stuff out. After three months of this cheap furniture and whatnot, people started complaining about the cheap furniture, and Bloomberg, and then, uh, Bloomberg said, this isn't a temporary project, it's permanent. What, are you kidding? I'm not going to take this away from people. Um, because he's got to learn, and you've gotta, we've got to learn from the cities and see that you know, in 2014, 15 cities, we, it has to be a win, 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 win solution. But we've got to have that feedback loop. So the point is, what... Um, the point is, is what gets measured gets done, is you get out there, you count, so you start saying, oh, we can design something that's for the people, because suddenly there was the willpower to do it, there was the understanding of what was doing it. You have a street like this, you change it into this street, so that you actually eliminate some of the road surface, ma rationalize where the people really want to go, give the, give the benefit to um, the pedestrians in some cases. We reclaimed 35,000 uh, square meters of space, um, which is significant in Manhattan. The point in here is that we, had, we saw a significant increase in people using that space, in the safety of that space, and really importantly, the taxi drivers who, you know, you don't want to anger the taxi drivers, right? Um, but the taxi drivers saw a 17% improvement in travel time which is maybe counterintuitive if you're really going to close down road surface, but it actually allowed them to get to where they needed to go faster and better and more efficiently. You saw an increase in value. We saw that um, in, in, in the larger places that we did this, the, the Department of Transportation did these studies, um, increase in value, uh, decrease in vacancy rates, increase in people stopping along the way. So you're actually increasing value by, by getting people closer to where they need to be. So the point is, what are you measuring? If you're, if, you, it, it's not enough to say we're going to increase, it's not enough for Blake Bloomberg to come out with a great vision and say we're going to incre increase ped pedestrian movement. We also need to find a way, what are we going to balance that with? Well, that means in this case, taking away some road surface, changing the capacity structure a little bit. And then we need, the third challenge is to exemplify change rather than to lobby for it. So what does that mean, building on what I just said? Having this vision, Copenhagen has worked uh, since the 60s when they went to the first pedestrian street and since Jan Gels first started going out and doing counts. They have regular counts. They know how the streets are changing. They know how people are using the street. These aren't GIS studies. These are actually qualitative studies of seeing what people are doing in the space to understand how the space is improving. And they've had, they've, so they got this really rich body of, of statistical data that they can see how things are changing. That's allowed them to build visions that start to say, importantly, um, the vision is, is, is really s quite specific in places. Okay, 80% yeah, of the people will be satisfied with opportunities they have in the urban life. That means you've got to make some really key moves to what that means. 
how are you going to, if you're going to have an increase in, in traffic, you need to match it, uh, sorry, increase in pedestrian movement, you need to match it with better bus services, you need to match it with um, uh, not allowing the street to become a rat run, you need to change certain roads, change parking, etc., do certain things that take a lot of willpower, but you need, to have the, you need to have the study and the measurements to understand how that's evolving so that you can refine, change, realize when you've made a mistake, increase when you've made it better. Um, so there's a lot of really precise things in that vision, which is really quite key. And I know that Bristol, through a lot of means, has the strategic vision, and I think they've been working really hard. And I think that's the thing of saying, how do you actually make sure that that movement goes right down to the people who are actually having to, you know, design the various bits and bobs, and also that the public understands it. Because it can't, it's not enough to be able to say, yeah, well, but I still want to have my car out in front of my house. Um, so that means that the municipal government needs to be moved from a doer to a facilitator very often, rather than being the master planner. We see that municipal governments are increasingly starting to say, we need to facilitate this change and find different ways of making it happen. That's not least because of economic measures. Um, we see in Mar de Plata, we've saw, we, we, did a, we did a project here uh, where the city came to us and said, look, we've got a street, we need to improve it, make some interesting changes. So they, they we, we had a process of analysis, strategy, intervention, evaluation, feedback loop, refine, change, alter, and keep doing that until we get to a point where at some point we'd have an intervention that was permanent. This is really different than the old style of the big master plan and the big project, the grand projet, as they would have in Paris, right? And we're going to build it all out. And, right? it's, it doesn't really work so much anymore, and it's not economically viable to do that anymore. So the small interventions where it's leveraging the existing assets, what have you got going on? Well, here's a neighborhood, we already have some people here, we already have a pretty healthy network of shops. How can we make it better for people to be there? How can we make it more friendly? Increase what we've got, amplification of what we've got and amplify the timeline as well. In this place, again, really simple, cheap, temporary things, throwing down some cheap furniture and some paint, some of it may be quite hideous. The benefit of social media is people started complaining but those benches are ugly. Oh my God, look what you've done, these stupid planters, there's no coherence, all this stuff is going on, da 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 The city came to us freaking out. You've got to stop. People are mad, they're really angry, oh my God, they're complaining about the benches on Twitter. And we sort of said, oh my God, people are complaining about the benches at Twitter. Well, actually, people are talking about the benches. They're paying attention to public space. You've got people engaged. Win. Win. Fantastic. Build on it. Go talk to those same people. What happened? Well, we could actually then measure and see that people cared. Get out there. Start talking to them. They took it. They did a series of sort of workshops to listen to what the people said. Listen to them bitch and moan as well as applaud. And started, but started asking the right questions. Well, come on, come on. So the, the bench is ugly. What do you need? And pretty soon, took a little vote. 90% of the people said, keep it. Of course keep it. Make it better. Improve it. It's, a, it's improving our lives. In Market Street, in San Francisco, very similar, sort of coming through, the city came to us and said, we need to start to evolve a framework on Market Street. I'm, again, I'm really truncating this to keep, I'm sure I'm over time already. But on Market Street, trying to look at a really, really heavily, heavy, heavy street with lots of transportation that is a miserable place to be walking on, and it's a miserable place to cross, but it's got some really valuable real estate. So how can we make it a better place? How can we make it more um, appealing? We'll come up with a flex flexible framework. We tried to work on improving mobility, giving a sense of place, recognizing that this had to improve quality of life, linking transport with place. But really what was critical in this was how do we do it? Right, how do we fund it? San Francisco, California has been in a rather big financial crisis, if you haven't noticed for the past several years. Uh, and everybody in the Department uh, of, of, of Urban Planning was you know, terrified of losing their job tomorrow. So how do you do this? Well, actually, what was interesting was the city found a way to start to create some new partnerships and a new way of working. And um, created some new fast-track planning approvals, some new kind of ways of getting right down and seeing how they could um, streamline their own process, get people within the whole city council working together, um, breaking down the barriers and breaking down the silos, and announcing some, some new ways of working. So this Living Innovation Zone was a project, a pilot project that they took on, 
where they had the city opening public assets. They had a number of partners who were actually providing a lot of the knowledge and the skills to do things. And the community who were coming in was sometimes the sweat equity, sometimes helping with some of the finance, um, and, and a lot of times um, just simply you know, being present in the environment. And this really actually, here's some of the partners that were going on. Um, this produced some projects that were happening along Martin's Market Street that are temporary, anywhere from five weeks to you know, five months or something that were self-funded, but the city found ways to get, um, to get them approved, to help support them, trying to get things uh, happening on Market Street, get some new activity and some new awareness. It got a lot of different people involved, um, and again, it had the same effect of getting people out there. And once you've got people out there, then you can start talking to them, because people are suddenly, if they're finding it convenient again, if it's convenient to walk from point A to point B, if it's convenient to take the bus and go from the bus to the next place to the next place, then I'm willing to do it because it actually means I don't have to get my car out and pay for parking and do all that sort of stuff. And that really does radically change lives. So these are things that have a, have, have a, have a big impact. And so the next generation of citizen engagement, I think, is really coming to this uh, top-down and bottom-up collaboration, where you've really got to create this mix. And I think Bristol is someplace where this is certainly viable. I mean, it's going on, right? I mean, Bristol's got a very vocal public, I think it's fair to say. And, you know, you've got to have a city with strong visions and the capacity and the, and the, and the knowledge, but obviously you've got that from the citizens as well and by public, uh, by the local enterprise, et cetera, being able to come in with support and partnerships. So those three challenges, I'd say, are about measuring, measuring your behavior, considering behavior. What are you counting, right? Are you counting how fast the cars can continue to run through the city or how, how well the people can move through the city? A quantitative or qualitative thing. And trying to think about a process rather than the product. Those are the things that we found that are really working for cities and, and are really big challenges. The point is, if the city works for them, and here I'll make a little point. Jan Gell was just once met by someone in the street saying, gosh, Copenhagen has a fertility boom. Everybody's pregnant or has children. There's all these children all over the Copenhagen. And he said, God, yeah, you're right. There's loads of children. And there are. There's prams all over the place. And these wee children are walking around. And all the nursery crash children are walking around the city. And you think, yeah, no, Copenhagen's like doing this in terms of fertility. It's because people are happy having their kids out in the street. My little three-year-olds would go from their inner city nursery down to the slaughterhouse to like talk about animals. And they would go all walking out in their little snow suits like this. It's because it's a nice place to be. So if you see kids in the city, that's pretty good. The city's working for them. If you see those folks out in the city, win. Because equally, that means it's a good place. It means it's easy to get around. It means it has good opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. If it works for those two generations, you don't have to worry about those folks, right? The creative hipsters, they'll come, right? Thank you.